Hi, this is Ben Rader with the Milwaukee Affiliate for Social Living. And I'm here today to share with you my presentation on the psychology of hate, violence, and social divisiveness. This is what I originally gave to the Wisconsin School of Professional Psychology. The purpose of this conversation uh, and uh, presentation is to offer some perspective and awareness about why we've become so divisive or hateful in our way of communicating with each other over the last several uh, years. <clears throat> the uh, psychology of individual psychology offers us an antidote in uh, the concept of uh, social interest or community feeling. We are offering this presentation today with hopes of being able to promote greater sense of connection with one another and also with uh, uh, the uh, ethical imperative that we as clinicians can, can become more aware of our own blind spots and also the ways that we engage in unethical decision making frequently when we're not aware of our own biases. This presentation is uh, also an opportunity for us to look at ethics. Uh, we've modified this particular version of the presentation so that we can look at ethics and we can consider uh, ethical decision making from the standpoint of individual psychology and related perspectives. We're gonna be looking at three basic theories today and I'm really hoping that you'll be able to get something from this. You'll notice that various times there's gonna be pause for group interaction. Since this is a recorded presentation, we're hoping that you'll take some opportunity to actually hit pause and uh, participate in the activities and actually answer these questions as honestly as possible when they come up. If you're doing this in a group, even better. This is gonna be a great opportunity for your group to discuss these things and to learn something about how we're responding in these very polarized times. Our hope uh, today is that we're gonna be able to advance the cause of humanity and social discourse and in the process become better clinicians and better people. So without further ado, we're gonna share some of uh, the talking points in the presentation here and uh, we're just hope we're just glad to make this available to everybody, and hoping that you will uh, learn something from it. Um, if you are interested in continuing education uh, for this, there is a form uh, for that um, uh, is available uh, that uh, uh, will also help facilitate your uh, continuing education process and uh, give us some important feedback on how this presentation was. And here we go. The Psychology of Hate, Violence, and Social Divisiveness by the Milwaukee Affiliate for Social Living. Ethics version. This is a, a presentation, as I said, of the Milwaukee Affiliate for Social Living. Milwaukee Affiliate for Social Living uh, offers from a three-tiered uh, uh, initiative of promoting personal growth, professional development, and promoting community enrichment. We are an affiliate organization of North American Society of Adlerian Psychology, or NASAP. <clears throat> we have a conference coming up, but maybe um, uh, actually now in the past, if uh, you're uh, catching this uh, a little bit later on, uh, but the conference is going to be from May 27th to May 30th, and we're still looking for volunteers to participate in this conference. So contact us at masl. Uh, maslcommunity at gmail.com if you'd like to find out how you can participate in as a volunteer in this conference or even better um, go to alfredadler.org and register today. We have three main objectives in this uh, presentation. Uh, participants are going to be able to identify psychological explanations for social divisiveness and bias in general. We're going to also identify ways psychologists can address factors that are contributing to increasing divisiveness at the community level. And we're going to leave today with a greater resolution regarding these matters and steps that we can take now to promote greater social cohesion through our own professional and community engagement and presence. We're adding uh, three other objectives to this particular presentation since we're focusing on ethics. We're gonna look at 
uh, uh, be able to account for how personal psychology can be affected by the psychology of hate, violence, and divisiveness. We're also going to identify ways that this factors into ethical decision making and client care. And we're going to hopefully address your own responses through corrected action, including pursuit of supervision when needed. Every uh, year, uh, uh, the American Psychological Association puts together the Stress in America workshop, uh, or Stress in America survey. Uh, the survey is a rather extensive look at what causes uh, uh, stress and uh, distress in Americans and it gets, uh, it collects data on what is stressing people out. In 2016, the Stress in America findings were particularly uh, 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 troubling and are, uh, were uh, an impetus for us putting together this presentation. In 2016, 66% of the nation felt that, that um, the future of the nation was uh, a source of major stress. Also, the current political climate, 57% uh, said that the current political climate was uh, a source of distress and concern for them on a personal level. This suggests that things that we're reading in the news and things that are occurring in our nation <clears throat> do trouble Americans and cause us stress and distress. The fact that we don't have ready solutions for these challenges or what keep us focused on uh, the political juggernauts in our country and uh, uh, on, in our planet, <clears throat> hoping uh, for them to be able to find some solutions to these challenges that vex us so. Increasingly, it seems as if we're living in a world of greater divisiveness. Everywhere we go, we have people that seem to be um, uh, uh, sp uh, speaking out and uh, uh, conveying uh, concerns on matters that aren't easy for us to find solutions for or commonality on. <clears throat> One of the challenges that occurs in national discourse is as soon as one platform uh, uh, becomes prominent and and has a influence on a large percentage of population. There's others that seem to communicate in a way that suggests um, a contrary, a, co a, a, con a competing uh, view on things in a different narrative. As we continue to engage in discourse around these polarizing issues, it, it, it seems frequently that instead of finding commonality, we just find more division and greater separation. There's also a perspective now that uh, perhaps the world is becoming more violent. Uh, when we have publicized acts of violence and um, uh, acts of hate and aggression, it seems to impact upon all of us. We don't necessarily see in immediate uh, in our immediate future any hope that this violence is going to go away, uh, and instead, violence seems to be the source of uh, promoting more violence and more divisiveness. All of this causes up. Uh, caused us to, to pull into question Marvin Gaye's uh, prophetic statement uh, and, and uh, question in his uh, uh, music, what's going on? Today we're going to look at three different psychological perspectives for understanding the psychology of hate, violence, and social divisiveness. We're going to begin this presentation by looking at the brain's search for difference and how the brain itself sometimes equips us with um, <clears throat> the uh, necessary tools to keep us safe that can have an unintended secondary impact of making things more difficult for others around us. We also are gonna look at Alfred Adler's feelings of inferiority and understanding how healthy and unhealthy inferiority feelings can contribute to healthy or unhealthy social e exchanges. And finally, we're gonna look at social transactions and transactional analysis 
to understand the source of our divisiveness and how we engage sometimes in futile ways around common themes and concerns. <clears throat> we begin our discussion today in the brain and looking at how the brain operates as an organ to keep us safe and to uh, seek out social harmony and connection. We also look at the way that this can backfire at times to place other people at risk and uh, to, in the end, make our social existence more confusing. The brain search for difference is uh, covertly a search for potential threats. And since we're always scanning for threats in the environment, we sometimes find them in unlikely sources. Much of this work, uh, uh, this portion, portion of the conversation, owes a lot uh, to the work of Dr. Robert Sapolsky. <clears throat> he was, uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky is a neuroendocrinologist <clears throat> who's interested in biological anthropology. He studies stress in primates <clears throat> and is interested in trying to understand how primates find community with one another and also how this relates in terms to the brain and the body's uh, pursuit of healing and social reconciliation. The HPA axis <clears throat> is a central point of focus for much of Dr. Sapolsky's work. This looks at the, hypo the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary and adrenal cortex, which have a relationship with one another and with the entirety of our physiology. The HPA axis <clears throat> has been the source, has been a, a, a growing source of uh, research in critical scholarship and exploration of the brain and how it relates to what we refer to as uh, mind body monism. For the sake of our, for the sake of simplicity today, we'll talk about the HPA access as it relates to the stress the stress response system. <clears throat> Dr. Sapolsky has outlined how stress experienced by an organism impacts broadly upon the organism's physiology. Always, we are on lookout for threats. Our brain keeps us safe and it identifies danger. If we were living in a completely natural environment, <clears throat> we might be looking for threats in the form of uh, predators that could do us harm. The HPA axis <clears throat> is set into motion anytime we identify something that is perceived to us as a threat to our physical wellness or psychological well-being. Now, as humans, we actually enter into this quite honestly because we are dependent upon the herd and community life to keep us safe. All of us, regardless of culture and uh, society, Find our, find our belonging amongst other humans. In general, we use this sense of belonging to keep ourselves safe, to make preparations for the future, and to care for our young. At times, our herd life mindset can, can facilitate healthy growth and adaptation. However, at other times, this same mentality can offer great negative consequences that, if we are not careful, can be visited upon others and other herds around us. If we take in, as an example, a herd, when, it's identi a herd when, it's a, when it identifies a, th a threat in the form of a predator, the herd itself can uh, activate and become a f force of uh, protection and also a uh, source of power as it attempts to rid itself of perceived threats and risks. 
in nature we see this when a herd may gang up against a predator, <clears throat> injure the predator or, or chase it away, injure or kill the predator or chase it away for the sake, safe, sake of the safety of the rest of the herd. Now, <clears throat> all of us have been brought up and experienced life relative in, in the context of a certain herd. From this standpoint, we may look at the people around us in childhood and the and ways communities looked when we were growing up as a place in which we found belonging and involvement. We wanted to ensure, as we wanted to ensure our place within uh, the herd, we found roles that worked for us and that seemed to protect us from outs, uh, external threats, but also allowed, uh, also endeared us to the rest of the herd around us. However, yesterday's herd is now coming in greater uh, contact with diversity and with persons that, and cultures that have been unfamiliar to us and that we have not been prepared to deal with. <clears throat> diversity today offers us a broader experience of the human condition and what it means for us to find commonality and membership within society. Although the diversity, although uh, we welcome diversity and, and uh, look towards this in general as a favorable aspect of community life in society, as we maintain our old ways of being and experiences, we realize that we now have to accommodate and develop our way of thinking, feeling, and being in order to find a new place of belonging and acceptance. Diversity today, for many of us, has broadened our views of ourselves and has allowed us also opportunity for our culture and our society to grow and develop. However, it also offers new perceived threats, as we don't fully understand people that are different from us because of religion, ident identification, or culture, we may start perceiving in the new additions to our community and our society as threats, threats to our well-being and th threats to our capacity to, be, to find safety and security. Our own roles are forced now to evolve and at times, this brings with it the fear of the unknown. As we hope to be able to gain mastery over our environment and the world around us, it becomes easy for us to equate these new changes as being threats to us. So, as diversity advances and our society becomes more uh, inclusive and accepting of Divert of uh, differences and of different groups that are now trying to find their place in society, we find ourselves frequently responding in herd-like mentality, chasing off threats when we see them, anytime we don't understand them. This relationship is actually bidirectional. So, just as we may fear, just as we may see that. Others that are different from us are a threat. Invariably, we are perceived as a threat to others. This means that although all of us are trying to find commonality and belonging in social existence, we oftentimes see the new changes and diversity around us as a threat to who we are or how we are. Sometimes this has a real, real world impact upon others. If we are unable to accept and tolerate others as members of our herd, it becomes quite nat natural for us to identify them as threats. Okay, so now we're going to offer an ethical vignette, and uh, we'll introduce, we'll, uh, we'll um, uh, uh, invite some perspective here on the way that our sense of belonging and our, and our perceptions of others can 
get in the way of our ability to connect with others and to be inclusive. In this ethical vignette, we'll be looking at Letitia. Letitia is an African-American female working as a student intern in a small rural community 70 miles from a major city. She is the only person of color at the clinic and seemingly the only person of color in the entire town where she, is, where she has elected to do the final stint of her training. It is 7 p.m. one dark winter evening. All other staff and clinicians have already left the building. Letitia enters the lobby to meet her new client, a, Kate, a court mandated client chasing client facing charges for domestic violence. Once in the lab, lobby, Letitia finds a large menacing looking white man who looks rather unhappy. When he stands up, he looms over Letitia. It is then that Letitia notices some unfamiliar looking tattoos covering his forearms, hands, and neck. Oh my God, Letitia thinks to herself, are those white supremacist tattoos? Considerations. How might Letitia's thoughts and feelings influence the course of the session? How might Letitia's experience influence and shape the client's experience? What steps might Letitia take following the session to process the experience for ethical considerations? And finally, what systemic factors are at place and how might this influence Letitia's decision to address the situation with supervision? Take some time now and answer these questions. When you're ready, go on to the next section. Inferiority feelings and striving to be superior to others. Here we have Alfred Adler who uh, lived from 1870 to 1937. Alfred Adler is the founder of individual psychology and it's his work that we focus on through the work of the Milwaukee Affiliate for Social Living and through NASAP. Adler was a particularly great speaker who had a forward thinking perspective regarding diversity and acceptance of others and uh, who showed great awareness of how individuals find meaning and purpose through social contacts. One of Adler's famous quote, uh, uh, quotes is, Inferior, inferiority feelings are not themselves abnormal. They are the cause of all improvements in the position of mankind. <clears throat> Dr. Adler was also very aware of the role that prejudice plays in our experience and the limits that prejudice places upon social existence. Adler was able to identify the universa universality of prejudice. Those who have traveled have found that people everywhere are approximately the same in that they are inclined to find something by which to degrade others. So here we have in the center, the basic experience that many of us have uh, cultivated within ourselves throughout life. We have a feeling through our childhood and through our dependence upon the adult world throughout the first portion of our life that we ourselves are in some way less than those who have power and agency around us. Ultimately, we come to internalize this feeling of less than or feeling of inferiority as Adler labeled it. One common means for us to deal with the feelings of inferiority, inferiority is simply to work to be to strive to be superior to others by placing others in a box and lording over them and their functions, we may feel ourselves to be in control of the perceived threats that others offer through their general being. 
Now, the work of uh, Alfred Adler stimulated, uh, uh, have, has simulated the thought and uh, considerations of many psychologists that came after, most specifically the work of Kenneth and Mammy Clark highlights the work of Alfred Adler and how this can be applied in promoting peace and uh, coexistence throughout our society. Kenneth and Mammy were research psychologists that incorporated Adler's feelings of inferiority into re research on race and race identity. Kenneth and Mamie Clark used plastic dolls <clears throat> as a way to test in inherent bias that African American children's African American children had about uh, African Americans and what it meant to be black through their uh, exhaustive work uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark identified that African American children tended to uh, prioritize and prefer white babies over black babies this implica the implications of this or that the existence of racism and separation and exclusion in society caused African American children to devalue their own skin color and heritage. That race identity was a driving force in self esteem and personal value was a haunting and impactful finding of Kemeth and Mamie, Mamie's, Mamie Clark's work. The work of uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark attracted much attention. In addition to Martin Luther King, who was aware of the work of Kemeth and, Kenneth and Mamie Clark and integrated it into his work in civil rights was the uh, uh, acknowledgement of this work through this through the uh, Brown versus Board of Education case that ultimately identified the negative consequences of separate but equal. The unanimous decision made by the Supreme Court in 1954 effectively ended ended segregation in schools. <clears throat> They included the evidence from the work of Kenneth and Mamie Clark as identifying inferior, as uh, contributing to inferiority feelings stemming from pra the practice of segregation. Embracing equality, community feeling. Alfred Adler had uh, made use of the concept Gemein Schafsgefühl, which translates loosely to meaning something like community feeling or social interest. From the standpoint of individual psychology, community feeling and social in interest is pinnacle to the development of healthy so human relationships and uh, to uh, healthy psychological development. Ethical vignette. Ted is a student intern in a clinical program at a suburban mental health clinic that works with youth and families. Currently, he is serving a family that has a transgender family member, 16-year-old male to female. Ted is meeting with the family for the fir first time, Ted is meeting for the first time with the youth's father regarding the father's concern. The, the youth has previously informed Ted that the father has referred to the youth's gender identity as being, quote, delusional. The youth has no signs of delusional behavior, but has experienced some serious behavioral disruptions, including marijuana use in the home, destruction of family property, in the defacing of a family photo album and smashing of decorative plates, and inviting youth into the home that then stole from the family. Dad is a successful business owner and seems annoyed at Ted's questions. At one point, he scoffs at Ted's reference to the science of psychology 
and comments on the existence of how, of now of quote, fake science, unquote, which is like, quote, fake news, unquote. Dad is opinionated, outspoken, and commandeering. Ted is beginning to feel that dad is a narcissist. Considerations. How might dad's response to Ted be influenced by dad's own feelings of inferiority? How might dad be experiencing Ted and Ted's pre-existing relationship with the youth? How might Ted be influenced in his actions by feelings of inferiority? And finally, what might Ted be able to do to establish a productive alignment with dad, with dad and a sense of fundamental equality? Okay, now we're moving on to the next section, social transactions. The games we play with each other. This is Eric Byrne, who lived from 1910 to 1970. Eric Byrne uh, ex expanded and developed uh, Freudian perspectives and ultimately devised what he referred to as transactional analysis. Eric Byrne has some great perspective on how social relationships in early childhood in turn factor into the persons we become later in life. One of his great, great quotes is, a loser doesn't know what he will do if he loses, but talks about what he will do if he wins. And a winner doesn't talk about what he will do when he wins, but knows what he will do if he loses. Eric Byrne um, also had a multi-generational approach uh, of understanding the games that we live by and how we inherit these within family systems from one generation to the next. Games are passed down from generation to generation. The favored game of the individual can be tracked back to his parents and grandparents and forward to his children. Now, one of the things that came out of um, uh, Dr. Burns work is the idea of ego states. You and the other yous making decisions and responding to others. Uh, uh, Dr. Burns uh, work was uh, an expansion upon Freud's own ego psychology that looked at the superego, the id and the ego. We begin with the parent ego state, which is associated with the superego. The parent ego state is observing and judging in its role. Often time, the parent ego state is outside of our awareness and in that way, unconscious. The parent ego state is the internalization of our own caregivers from childhood. The parent ego state is the responsible one and looks at life as lessons learned. In contrast, we have the child ego state. This is associated with what Freud referred to as the id. The child ego state experiences derived from childhood and childhood experience. Like the parent ego state, the child ego state is often outside of our awareness and unconscious. It is emotion driven, it is spontaneous and immediate, and it is impulsive and seeks gratification. We get to the uh, third uh, ego state here, which is referred to as the adult ego state, and it's what Freud would have referred to as the ego. The adult ego state, though, is objective and observing. It's reality-based and it's present-minded. It has emotional awareness and it operates to predict 
What will happen next? The adult ego state is the state that integrates the adult and the child ego states. The work of um, Byrne also highlighted the games that we play and game playing that occurs in all of us. Game playing in this sense has to do with the rules that we learn. These are not always conscious either, and they are generally socially circumscribed. Games that we play are reinforced in society and by persons around us. And game playing is frequently identity oriented. As psychologists, we identify with our role as clinical psychologists and therefore adopt a whole set of practices and norms that are within our view of the role that we serve in society and serving others. We have our own ethics code that we follow, which sets its own framework for game play. The discriminative stimulus in this case refers to the context in which we learned how to play the games that we play. Discriminative stimulus determines how we engage at any given time with the, with the uh, circumstance and the context around us shaping how we then play and engage with others. So now this uh, 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 dis discussion uh, shifts to the focus of the individual. And what's the game that you're playing? as determined by your own personal history and lived experience. <clears throat> In order for us to have a, a game-based uh, 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 scenario, we oftentimes look at ourselves as vying against uh, a competing opponent. And at times we find ourselves in the ambiguity of the world, seeking an opponent against which to vie our time and energy. This gives us direction and purpose and sets the parameter for our game play. Nowadays, when we're looking at uh, game playing, one of the most common forms of game playing occurs in the context of political parties. We choose our opponent and we determine who we are, oftentimes in contention with those that we feel are operating in some way against our interests. Once we've determined which opponent we are playing against, we identify basic rules of the game. We allow our affiliations to determine how we think and feel, and we respond then in contention against the others that we perceive in the world around us based on circumscribed rules that we now internalize and adopt. We also find ourselves in such circumstances adopting to a particular ego state, either the wise parent that knows all the right answers and attempting to correct uh, and at times overcorrect the challenges in others, or the adult seeking to find ways to harmonize what's right and seems prudent with what we personally want and is advantageous to us. And the child child which would like more than anything to be gratiated and to have its way, to be able to feel as if the world is operating entirely on their terms. Once we select an opponent, we identify the rules that we're going to play and an ego state through which to engage with others, the game is on. Here's an ethical vignette. Heather has enjoyed working with Ethel for three years, the three years that she has served as Ethel's therapist at the assisted living retirement community where Ethel has been living. Heather and Ethel have, been, have had a great relationship which has served a therapeutic benefit for Ethel during a period of time that Ethel has felt abandoned by her family. Ethel feels that her family no longer appreciates her. 
and that she can no longer relate to her children and her grandchildren. This has not been the case with her therapist, Heather. Heather has experienced some positive regard for Ethel in the past years and greatly appreciates her supporting Ethel in light of her circumstances. However, she has been challenged recently with Ethel's response to world news around physical distancing on account of COVID-19. Ethel has now made several comments to Heather about the pandemic, seeming to view it as a sham, despite the facility having lost several residents on account of COVID-19. Ethel seems to want Heather's approval of these views. Suddenly, Heather is feeling agitated by Ethel. I have Esther, I apologize, I've <laughs> changed her name here, and fears that Ethel is being obstinate, a term that Ethel says her family have, has called her many times before. Considerations. What games seem to be at play in the exchanges between Heather and Ethel? And what broader social influences may be driving their current interactions? What ego states may be reflected in the transactions occurring between Ethel and Heather and might relate to Ethel's relationship with her family? What ethical issues might Heather want to consider as she engages with Ethel around her views on COVID-19? All right, now we're going to take some consideration for what it is that a clinician can do as a citizen. Um, these ethical vignettes often um, contextualize our work in clinical settings, but uh, it may be even more important for us during times of social division to be able to operate as citizens and to be able to invite greater perspective in the world around us. We have training and skill sets that can be of uh, if great benefit now in striking greater accord between humans and improving social relationships. This brings us outside of the clinic and into other venues. Ways we can engage public now are multifaceted. We may blog, we may create social media video series, we may host a community wellness or health fair, we may speak on the radio. We may submit an article or offer a free presentation. We may facilitate discussion groups in the community. All of these modes operate outside of the realm of clinical psychology, but offer our expertise to a larger audience. In order to do this, it'll be important for us to find some community partners. Radio stations, AM and public radio in particular, may be uh, uh, great opportunities for us now to reach audiences that are curious and wanting to learn more about what psychology has to offer. We may also approach church groups and religious organizations as partners for us to be able to offer healing messages and messages of cohesion to the larger religious faith-based communities. Schools have historically been a great place for psychologists and other mental health professionals to operate in order to pr promote uh, strategies at the level of the school and education and awareness amongst the students and the faculty. Libraries are also often available for us and can be completely free of charge if we have the right connections and have an opportunity to share perspectives that seem salient to the community. We also may find ourselves reaching out to Rotary Clubs and civic organizations, the movers and the shakers of our community and helping understand the way that psychology can be applied to promoting greater connection within the community through these organizations. Local newspapers may be a source for us to be able to offer some perspective and, perspe and uh, share some um, views on social issues and current affairs through the writing of articles. And finally, it's important for us to reach out to our elected officials who represent us and our interests and who would benefit perhaps the most from perspectives on 
social on uh, healthy social relations and ways to promote social connection and healthy society in the communities in which we live. All right, we will now be uh, shifting to some common group interventions. Now, these are interventions that we've designed for the purpose of helping uh, advance social uh, cohesion and harmony in different settings. These group interventions can be done with students, religious groups, community groups, or on your own. The three uh, group interventions that we are be interventing today or offering today are uh, the common, common grounding exercise, which is seen as an antidote to the brain search for difference. The valuing of others exercise, which is seen as the antidote to feelings of inferiority. And unveiling your true opponent exercise, which is the antidote to social transactions. All right, you may wanna take a bit of a break now, stretch your legs, and we are hoping that you'll be able to um, benefit here from a more interactive component of this presentation. First section, identifying who is the object of your social animosity. So before we get into uh, these uh, three interventions, it will be helpful for you to have a group in mind that you may want to uh, uh, identify or work with with the hopes of being able to advance greater sense of social connection and to get past your own, the, own, the impediments that you may have as an individual and, uh, clinician and uh, uh, citizen in your hopes to become more uh, engaged in uh, community in the world around us. Take a moment to identify a group or social demographic that you have Ex that you experience a strong social reaction to. Consider a group or social demographic that you have had some history of butting heads with, or that may have difficult, or that you may have difficulty seeing eye to eye with. Or look for a group that you have a strong personal response to that you may find concerning. Consider a group social demographic that you would like to be able to engage with a, on a healthier, more constructive basis, but that has been difficult to connect with for whatever reason. Now write this group down and have it available for the following interventions. Common grounding exercises, uh, exercise, antidote to brain search for difference. The first step here is to identify the threat. What might, you seem what might seem threatening to you about this group? Take a moment and write down your answers. And where in your body might you experience the sense of threat? Some of us find ourselves uh, confronted by uh, things that are threatening to us and have an upset stomach or tension uh, in the back or the head. Being able to locate where you physically experience this will give you some clues as to how uh, you're being personally affected by the perceived threat of others. Step two, identifying the difference. What might seem different from you about this group? And when did you first start becoming aware of the difference between yourself and this group? These questions can give us clues about your own uh, vulnerability and also uh, may highlight distortions that later come with seeing others as being different. Step three, now identify categorical similarities. In what life domain area does this distance difference exist for you and this group? Your respective involvement in this group makes this a categorical similarity with, with your differences only mattering to the degree to which each of you identify with this group. The more you each identify with the difference, 
the more similar you actually are. So take a moment and answer in red here. Uh, we are both similar in that we are both blank. All right, now step four, identifying alternate categories. Now, identify five personal variabilities that are not determined by your categorical differences. These are areas of potential similarity between yourself and members of this group or demographic. Note, each one of these offers membership potentially more, to potentially more significant category of commonality and difference. Even though we are different in some ways, there are also things that we have in similarity, such as dot, 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 Write down your five examples of things that are not necessarily differences as determined by membership in these distinct groups. And now finally, step five, identifying similarities. Now identify five characteristics, traits, or experiences that you absolutely do share with members of this group or social demographic. Note that only after noticing that there are some things that are potentially not different about us, that we start being able to identify that there are essential things that are necessarily the same or similar. As humans, there are so many things that we do have in common. And some of these are dot, dot, dot. Okay, now you're done with the first activity. If you look back at your responses, you'll see at the very beginning what it was that constituted the threat and perhaps some insight into why that group was seen to be so different. As we move through the, uh, the activity, we were able to identify categorical similarities that stem logically from the very differences which we found held us apart. We were then able to explore some things that aren't necessarily different about us. And ultimately, we were able to identify five things that we have in common. Next exercise is the valuing of other exercise. This is the antidote to feelings of inferiority. When we have feelings of inferiority, we oftentimes mistake our own strong values and biases as being examples of things that make us necessarily right and others necessarily wrong. It's our tendency uh, with feelings of inferior inferiority to try to diminish or deny the things that are important to others. So in this set of activities, we'll be looking at recovering what is important to ourselves and also valuing what's important to others. Step one, embracing your own values. Oftentimes, strong emotional responses to others occur when our own value system was in some way tripped or triggered. Consider what personal value or values might be reflected in your response to this group or social dem demographic. A value that I, strong, that I hold strongly and that is important to me is blank. Now step two, naming and embracing the values of others. Although we can experience a clash of values between ourselves and others, there's no reason why values in and of themselves need to clash with each other. Take a moment to consider a value or value set that you perceive in the other person. A value that you seem to hold is blank. I can appreciate how important blank is to you. By identifying that others have values also, it humanizes them and actually holds them in a higher regard for the things that we may perceive to be different. And finally, step three, choosing to value difference. Now take a moment to consider what it is what is valuable about the differences that exist between you and the individual or group and why it is important to value and uphold this diversity. 
I like that we can be different in our blank. It is important to support this diversity in society because blank. Now, if you've been able to honestly answer all of these questions and reflect not only on your values, but honor the values of others, we are one step closer to eradicating the divisiveness, hate, and violence that we see in the world around us. Final interaction, or final um, uh, intervention, unveiling your true opponent. And this is an antidote to social transactions. Step one, name the game. Although we have come across our responses honestly, as we take greater account of our responses to others, we can see how our own reactions are scripted out for us through social interactions or games that we play in society. Take a moment to consider what game might be at play when it comes to you and the object of, of your animosity. Although my feelings seem real to me, when I consider my behavior in response to this group, it seems this might be another example of the blank game. Now, there's a bit of a disclosure, a bit, a bit of a, a, an, an, an amendment here to this one, a, a clarification, and that is oftentimes what we hold up uh, as being near and dear to us may actually be in some form a disguise for a game that we're playing that we may not feel comfortable owning. An example of this might be trying to uh, intellectualize or to have the right answer as a way of talking over others and as a way of being right. In this case, if we're able to identify the game that we're playing as intellectualization or uh, one upping the other, we no longer stand on a moral higher ground, but instead are able to identify our own vulnerabilities and our tendencies to behave in defended ways. Step two, identifying the significance of this game to you. The, game, the games we play have personal value and importance that we may not fully understand in the moment when we engage in it today. Consider for a moment, number one, when was it that you first learned this game? And two, how might it have helped you at that time? I first learned this game when I was blank. At the time, the game helped me by blank. Step three, unveil your true opponent. Although it may feel that the current opponent, the group or social de demographic that we are responding to, this entity may, although it may feel that the current opponent, the group or social demographic that we're responding to, this entity may serve as a stand-in for someone or something that you were previously affected by in your past. Given what you just considered about when you first learned to play this game, Take a moment and consider who or what your current reaction might actually be directed at from your own personal history. After closer examination, it looks like the opponent that continues to impact upon me the most to the point of disrupting my social relations today is blank. Now, once we answer this question, we have un un unveiled our opponent and have also offered us an opportunity through supervision and through our own clinical work, um, perhaps in our own therapy, to be able to uh, eradicate ourselves of this uh, past opponent and to be able to open now in freer and more open transactions with others around us. In review, we had three models for uh, explaining, explaining social divisiveness. We looked at the brain search for difference in the work of Robert Sapolsky. We looked at inferiority feelings through the work of Alfred Adler. And we looked at uh, social transactions through the work of Eric Byrne. Are there any others that we as psychologists are familiar with that could be helpful when sharing constructive perspectives with the general public or that could be of benefit in addressing these issues in our world today? How do you see professional clinicians applying these perspectives and serving in a role to promote a more harmonious, to promote more harmonious social relations? Thank you for considering these, these thoughts and 
take a moment here to familiarize yourself with uh, these uh, uh, related readings and resources. And that ends our uh, uh, first uh, our presentation here on uh, the uh, psychology of hate, violence, and social divisiveness. I hope that you learned something uh, from this, and more importantly, I hope that you be able to maybe take some of these tools forward uh, and uh, share these with others as we continue trying to help our society find greater commonality, acceptance, and inclusion, a world of uh, peace and security it's certainly a world uh, worth working towards. Thanks, take care, and be well. <laughs>